And we are rolling. Okay. So first off, please introduce yourself. I'm Robert Mybeck. I was born in East Chicago, in the, well, in Chicago, Illinois. I lived in East Chicago for the first three years of my life. I moved to Crown Point when I was three because my dad's job took him down there. And that's where I grew up, except I went to military school for the last three years of high school, and I'm a graduate of Purdue University. And I went into masonry after I served in my two years in the Army. What year was that? 1953. And how long you been in masonry? 63 years. 63 years? My degree was finished, the third degree was finished in March of 54. Can you tell me about Freemasonry in general? Freemasonry in general is an association of people who like to associate together and like the ritual and the t teachings of Masonry. It originally was a bond between the manufacturers or the builders of King Solomon's Temple and each other. And since then it has come down through the ages and has been opposed a lot, particularly by Muslims and Catholics, Catholics and Lutherans. And a lot of it is because the breakout to Protestantism church system is because they came from the Catholic Church and kept some of their resistance to other organizations that were not connected with the church or had a religious contact that they didn't like because it didn't go through the church. What is a past master? What is a past master? Fat Master is a man who has served all these, all the stations in Lodge, including the Master, and at the end of his Master's year, he is no longer Master, he's no longer in the line, but he is a past Master. And as such, is part of the structure of the Lodge that keeps it going. Would you like to talk about how the Lodge is dedicated to St. John at all? I am not sure anymore because of my age I forgot the teachings, but I think it was because St. John was the right hand person of Jesus, but he was also part of the temple in Jerusalem where he reigned and at one time became the head of the Christian religion. Discuss your Masonic journey. Sixty three years, twenty one in Lodge in Crown Point, actually twenty four, I can't count, and the rest of the time here in East Chicago. I knew Bruce Alden and his dad because of singing with the Chine Chanters. I knew Bruce, he was singing with his dad, and I met his dad otherwise, and they said they would help me transfer up here to Indiana Harbor Lodge 686. And I did. I picked it 686 one because of them and because of where it was located. And after I got in there, I found I knew a lot of the members. And then secondly, I didn't want to go into the two Hammond lodges because of where they were located at the time, which was downtown Hammond. And I didn't want to go downtown Hammond at night. 
So my retired journey has been Lake Lodge in Crown Point and Indiana Harbor Lodge in, in Highlands. And I also have done, done the Scottish Right, and I'm 50, 60 years in that, and 50 years of some in the shrine. And I sang for, oh, 15 years with the shrine chairs. I can split this up in like three separate questions. If the full question is what has masonry done for you as a man, an employee, and as a philosopher, if you want to, we can just take it step by step. If you got nothing to say, then we go on to the next one. So start right. now. Well, what has masonry done for you as a man? Uh, it helped me keep my life in order so that I could be a good citizen. What about as an employee? Pardon? What about what has Masonry done for you as an employee? As an employee? Well, part of it was that I had a friend at Hammond who was the past master of Garfield who helped me learn my three degrees when I had to learn them. But it helped me as an employee to keep myself straight and not mess around and behave myself. And what about as a philosopher? I'm not sure that he gave me a philosopher, philosophy because, let's put it this way, my father was a mason. All three levels of it. Blue Lodge, Consistory, and Shrine. And he was pretty strict on me behaving myself. And so that's what I learned as far as the philosophy was you make yourself presentable to the public and you'll win. If you don't, you'll lose. How does it affect really your, uh, your method of thinking or how you think about other things or subject matters? Does it influence your opinion on things or is it changing your opinion? Not on really. I will say this, that I can't understand some of the opposition that the new churches and some of the, the, you know, Lutheran and Catholic churches have two masonry once I learned the ritual. I don't understand the opposition because we don't teach devil worship and they say we do and they're wrong. I actually have a question about that later on, <coughs> about the public's opinion of masonry. Yeah. So we can talk about that more later. Uh, in your free time, is there anything you'd like to study or learn? Not really. I do crossword puzzles. <laughs> and Masonic stuff doesn't generally show up in crosswords because you're not supposed to print any of it. If you see it in print, you've got an illegal book. But I have a... <coughs> DVD of a murder mystery, murder program that takes place in Canada where the event takes place in a Canadian Masonic Lodge and in one of the part of the ritual they are supposed to drink out of a skull, drink the blood and it's red wine and they managed to kill the candidate because somebody spiked the wine. So it was a murder mystery that took place inside of a Canadian Masonic temple. And uh, some of the ritual is like ours and some of it isn't. And I don't know enough about Canadian Masonry to know which is right and which is wrong. They're probably not drinking out of skulls, I'm going to guess. It was a skull. They showed the skull. But that was, you said you watched a movie, though. It wasn't like, or was that supposed to be like based off of a I story? have no idea. <coughs> but I do know 
that it was it's filmed in Canada, and it's called Murdoch's Mysteries. And it is a program that if you really want to see a decent, on the level, mystery program with the police involved, Canadian police or English police, if you want to call it that way, then watch it. It's on um, Canadian television, C CNTV, I think it's Canadian National Television, and also one other one that showed in the United States. The Canadian television doesn't. What about, uh, you know, growing up or in your youth <clears throat> when you weren't, you know, either working or going to school or being in the military? Is there something you'd like to read or something you'd like to study in the meantime? Any hobbies? No, not really, because uh, I knew, well, let's put it this way. I didn't really like it, but I had to because I was in the military academy, so I had to study ROTC, and I got pretty much familiar with all the rules of the infantry, infantry and some of the artillery. And when I went into the Army after I graduated from college, the, I was assigned to Fort Sill, Oklahoma in the artillery. And I was surprised how much of basic artillery that I had absorbed at Culver and the TMI by not by learning the infantry. So this should be interesting. Is there any life experienced wisdom you would like to impart to younger generations? Ooh, behave yourself. No, keep an honest background. Don't get yourself into any problem which later on can conflict with things that you might want to do, which could include your employee, employment, and also could be, include things you want to, organizations you want to join, and you would be turned down because of that occurrence in your background. Can you describe the relationships you've had, either in lodge or out, with uh, old and younger brethren? I have had <clears throat> deep respect for the older ones. They, the older ones, they give me respect for the knowledge that I do have, and the younger ones come up and ask questions and see if I can help them. So that helps me, and it keeps me on a straight and narrow. You know, Ben's big thing was communication. <clears throat> I think he's 81, and he said that you know he's really tried to focus on communicating with younger people just to, because you can always learn something from somebody else, whether they're young or old, so he likes to give them that opportunity to well, see what they got. Well, right. you're right. You learn something from the younger, younger and old. We always do, because the younger generations now are changing their beliefs and tenets almost every year because of the things that they run into. Because some of the older people think that they're right and the younger kids are wrong. And the younger kids are proven, trying to prove that they are somewhat right and that the older folks are somewhat wrong. The problem is you get the people that are in their 50s and 60s they want to tell the guys in their 30s that, hey, you're full of it. Get straight. I'm right, you're wrong. Well, they aren't. The way the pattern that they have to live in is different from what that 50 year old grew up in. What would you like to say to men wanting to petition the lodge for membership? One, make sure your background is clean, and two, keep your mouth shut until you petition. Don't say anything that could be picked up and cause you to be turned down. Just keep yourself clean.
and straightforward. Do you think the quality of human life would improve if there were more Masons in the world, if the quantity of Masonry... I think so, yes. <coughs> if they all believe in the teachings that they were taught, and they went through the degrees, then I think they would be. Your little dog shot in the video, can't hurt. Your dog. Brandy? Look at her. Look at him. Brandy. Brandy. She got to go out or something? No. <coughs> there you go. Sit. Ha ha Where'd the cat go? She left as soon as you did. Go look at your bed. Stop there. Then she don't mind <laughs> what she did in a blue chair. I don't think she went out the door. No, she wouldn't go out. And the window in the back door is shut because it was interfering with his recording. Oh, okay. That's fine. And you're on camera. Oh, hi, people. <laughs> Bye, people. <laughs> I'm going to ask that last one again, just to make sure we got a you know good response on. It. So that was, you know, as the will the quality of life improve if the quality the quantity of maces rises in the world? I think it would be, would be because they would have the code of conduct to live by that is taught in the Masonic lodges. And this goes along what you started with, which was the public's opinion on Freemasonry. How do you think it's perceived? How would you like it to be perceived? I would like it to be perceived with a great deal of respect. But I think now the public thinks we're a bunch of dumb nuts. Because whenever you see them with their aprons out in public, like they would be for a dedication of a Masonic monument, they look at him like, ooh, yeesh. Look at those stupid nuts. They don't realize what the apron is for. It's for purification. And to keep yourself pure. And behave yourself. How do you think outsiders can trust Masons while they're excluded from the fraternity? Well, Chuck, do that. <clears throat> how do you think outsiders, people that are not not non Masons, how do you think they can trust Masons or or respect them when they're excluded from the fraternity? You know, being that they're they're not allowed. I, have, I really have no opinion on that. Mm -hmm. Outsiders, uh, like I just said, they think sometimes we're nuts. They think sometimes we're anti God. I forget the name that I want, but it's for atheists. They think we're really atheists and we worship an idol in the name of St. John or King Solomon. And they think we're, like I said, we think we're non religious. Would you talk about the history of the lodge at all? Any, any, uh, anything you want to say about the lodge? Whether it's history or maybe just opinion. I'm on not that well informed on that because I never really paid attention to it. I paid attention to the history of the local lodge. So I don't know that really the development, how it developed. I know it came from England and was developed in the New England states at first. But I don't know, I don't remember what I was taught about where it went from there. You know, uh, former Worshipful Master of Lodge from last year, David Miller, who just was interviewed, he kind of took that question in a different direction, where he, he didn't want to talk about the history of the building or just the history of masonry in general. He was only talking about the actual masons themselves, officers that have, that have been there. Right. 
you know, he thinks a lot of the history is really just the people that have come and gone, not necessarily the charter that's on the wall well, or the. A lot of a lot of the people that were prominent in the government of the United States were Masons, and part of the reason that we have what we have that day in the United States, the shape of the United States, is because of the people that came through earlier that were Masons. Now, I don't know what President, uh, President, President thinks of Masonry, because he's been quoted on everything else but, but I think his President, apparently his preceders earlier back, maybe four or five ahead of him, were Masons, or at least respected Masonry because they had Masons in their cabinet. Do you have any Masonic stories you'd like to share, something personal, historic? Well, no, not really. Uh, other than the fun that I've had and the enjoyment that I've had in doing the degree work, both in Crown Point and here, and substituting as an organist when when I need one. That's been fun. Uh, for the first six, three, three to six months last year, I was the substitute organist at Griffith because their organist died. But I got tired of doing that. I wanted to stay home. But I would sub, I subbed at uh, Garfield for a while. And again, two nights a week, that, particularly when I was still working, got too much. Well, I'm glad you're still doing the organ at, uh, as much as you are over at Harvard. I think it really adds to something. And, uh, you know, I'm going to be just saddened for being inside a fairly young Mason, but just to see you pass that torch on to somebody else. I and mean, you have your own style of playing. And when you're not there, like, I hear that song or, or those tones in my head. It's actually been uh, something that's stuck with me for quite a while. Well, one thing that always tickles me is um, the, when the lodge is in the singing mood, they do sing the lodge, in the lodge, the guy that starts it off is flat, and the rest of them, they hit the wrong notes, and they won't listen to me on the organ, huh? Until halfway through. And by the time that they're halfway through, I'm fed up with trying to get them on key. On key. And I'll be honest with you. Actually, I'm the third or fourth organist they've had since I came into uh, 686. And I've had it for 10 or 11 years. I don't know how long Bob Coffey had it or his predecessor. But I do know that I've had it for 10 plus years. And I was sorry that I had to miss that many last year and the year before that. But <clears throat> let's face it, my health wasn't too good. It's better now, so I can at least get there. But I am, if it, if it stays too dark, if it gets too dark before the lot starts, I'm restricted in how far I can drive. I'm just lucky that it's only four miles from my house. Because the furthest I can go, daytime-wise, is Crown Point, and that's by the lung doctor, because he doesn't want me well, not being able to breathe and get stuck. And so he said the furthest I can go is uh, the VA. You found point. So that is even short of the distance to the Main Street location of Lake, Lake Lodge, but I think I go far enough east at the <coughs> county building there on 91st Street that I could go south on Main Street to get to Lake Lodge and still be in the distance I need.
So that's it. That's why I miss. And sometimes my hands get so numb from the neuropathy that I can't play it right. So I don't want to go and be sour, particularly on a degree where there's more music than the others. Well, I want to personally thank you for committing to that <clears throat> and still sticking it through, showing up and doing what you do do. I mean, you, well, you, you don't know. have, you, I mean, you've, you've been amazing for 63 years. You don't know them shit. You can just stay home. Mm -hmm. So it's good to see that you still have a heart to, to even come out there and participate. Yeah, I feel guilty when I can't get there. Either music or no music. Now, I am lucky that Mike will pick me up. So when I can't drive, I can call him. For instance, if it gets too dark and I, I feel like going, my music is out in the secretary's office, so I can go and Mike pick me up and go. But the only problem there is if you take the second and third section of some of the degrees, there's no music. And I get to sit there and listen. Well, there's times that listening can get awful boring because you want to be doing something, but my neuropathy won't let me. You know what I mean? So there I is. Now, excuse me. I gotta have my liquid refreshment. What's in there? Whiskey? No, just Coke. <laughs> <clears throat> and if any of the lodge members want Chester's Plymouth Red Hot. Fries, I'll keep this bag and give it to them because it burns. Yeah, those suckers are hot. <clears throat> My interview inter interviewer tried it and he got it hot, but he didn't. What he didn't tell me how hot it was until I ate it. Wow. <laughs> I told you you got something to drink. You got something to drink. At least the... I did. <laughs> I needed it, too. And yeah, those are creepers. <clears throat> Just be happy you didn't continue eating the whole bag. We probably wouldn't be having this conversation right now. probably be in the bathroom. Now, show my picture, my suggested hat for the master to wear on St. Patrick's Day. You going to give it to you to put on? Right there. See it? The green hat. <clears throat> Now I'm a St. Patrick's Day Master. Oh, we're doing the interview with that for the rest of the time. Uh -huh. <laughs> Do you want to wear it? No. Okay. <laughs> Aren't we done? I want to ask you a couple more questions. Okay. You, you want to take that? No, I'll just do it this way. All right. Uh, the last, uh, I got three questions here. So, uh, can you detect honesty? Can I do what? Can you detect honesty? Can you tell when someone's being honest or truthful? We sort of. It takes a while though to, to talk to them to find out. But I pretty much can tell when somebody's being false or it's And if you can comprehend the past, can you comprehend the future? Mm, not really. The past, yes, but uh, I'm not that e that good at seeing what's going to be coming because I live in the present and I don't look at to see what the future is going to bring because partially I qualified for promotions in the Army in the future and didn't get them. I qualified for department bosses at NIPSCO and didn't get them. And that's why I retired early. I retired when I was 60. I'm now 88. 
So that makes me, if you look at the picture real close, that makes me an old goat. And I went to the, since I grew this goatee, I went to the driver's license bureau, the Indiana license bureau, and asked them, should I have the picture retaken? And they said yes, and so now I've got my picture on my life driver's license looking like this. With the hat too? No. I didn't take the hat. <laughs> The hat was bought as a whim, and not necessarily because of St. Patrick's Day, because I bought it in February. That's when they had all the stuff around Valentine's Day at Target. So that's where I got it, because I happened to like the Derby. Well, when St. Patrick's Day came around, I put it on and had some fun with it. And I think... I think I made it to Lodge that week and wore it, but I'm not sure. I don't remember. Wear it next time. Hmm? Wear it next time. Don't even say anything. Yeah, I Just could. Hold on in. They might, uh, they might say, though, that I was the master at the time because the guys that are coming through now don't try to put on the, the high hat, the, the, the top hat that they wear, most of the Lodges wear because uh, our sizes don't fit, so they wear hats of their own. So you'll have to, if you get in line at all for anything, you'll have to either wear the hat you got on your head or find something else. And you could get, they had high hats like this. <laughs> Not this color, but they had high hats around uh, Valentine's Day at Target. Maybe we should just put that on the rack where all the top hats are. Let's put it up there and see how long it takes somebody to notice. Yeah, that's false. <laughs> I bet Bruce will uh, notice that in two seconds. Which Bruce? Oh, yeah, that's true. Uh, Bush. Yeah. Bush is always, you know, turning and looking at Worshipful Master. I wonder how long it'll take him to notice. Well, how long would it take and uh, notice if uh, the present <coughs> master would wear this? <laughs> I'm not going to let him do it, but it's my hat. <laughs> <coughs> I'm going to ask you one more question, and if there's anything you want to talk about after this, we can. Okay. So the last question is, what have you yet to learn? I think I've learned everything that they can teach me. Not necessarily Masonic. Oh, anything. well, yeah, but I mean, uh, all right, I've got to learn how to make that thing work right. I come, I've got to learn how to do my cell phone. And learn how to stay healthy so I can come to lodge. Is there anything you want to talk about? Any uh, family history, or history in general? No, in life, just that, uh, <clears throat> my dad was, his, his mom passed away, and he had two sisters, one of whom was adopted by a family in East Chicago. They were named Shalander. They were Swedish. And dad and his sister were sent to Plymouth in an orphanage. And then both of them were raised in Auburn, Indiana by a family named Kelly. So I can legitimately wear this green hat because until the end of World War I, my dad was Walter Kelly. Not what he was born at, which was William Maybach. Maybach. And... <clears throat> He didn't find out what his real name was until he came back to East Chicago and found his sisters. And then Grandma Schlander told him that he was Maybeck, and what he did was he spelled it phonetically. 
M-Y-B-E-C-K. And when I was in Germany, I learned that it should have been M-A-A-M-A-E-B-A-C-H. But I wasn't going to change it. Because my dad had created so, so much respect for the name Mimek that it was great. Let's put it this way, when his wake, when he died, in his wake at the funeral home, it took four hours for people to come and go to pay their respect to him. And they stayed for the, for the day of the funeral. They all came to the cemetery and it looked like, well, it looked like half the town was there. That's how crowded it looked. So dad had friends. And it was because of his honesty and the character that he created by being honest. And his motto was, don't screw the public. Because he was a county clerk, deputy county clerk for eight years, a county clerk for eight years, and director of public works and supply under Governor Stricker for four years. After that, he worked for Bindy Hall and Curran as an, as an Iowa, in the as an architect, as an engineer in Gary. Then he, he became the chief architect of redoing the Crown Point school system. And then while he was doing that, he passed away. What was that? Uh, I got to do some. He was 75 years old, so it was 91 and 75. That's nine years there. So it was 1964. I think, wait a minute. 1975 would have been 166. So he was 60. Well, I think it was 60. Well, no, I can't remember, but it was in the 60s. He was. 75 years old. How old are you now? Me? 88. I'm the only one left. My kid younger brother, John Mybeck, who was also a Mason in Lake Lodge, died when he was 72, I think. And my twin brother died he was also a Mason in Illinois. He died when he was also 70. Did you say twin brother? Yeah. Did he but, look like you? Huh? Did he look like you? No. <clears throat> we were non identical. I looked like, well, let's put it this way. They said that Dick looked like the Swedish side of my mom's family. And I looked like my dad, my dad's side, and my bags. And I can't prove that because I didn't know any of the past history of the my bags. And there were no pictures, and my dad's birth certificate burned when the city of Hall, city hall in East Chicago burned in the 1800s or 1900s. I forget which. But about the late 1900s or the early, uh, wait a minute, let me get it straight. He was, born in 1890, he was born in 1891. He said, I've always said 1892, but I found out it was 1891. And uh, so there was, there was somewhere with those 20 years, the first 10 years you can get into uh, the 18, 1900s and the last 10 years of the 1800s. And that's when the certificate or the city hall burned and they had to rebuild it. And now all the records burned with it. So anybody that's been born in East Chicago 
earlier than that, when it was a town, lost all the history, uh, his, histrionics of their family. You so know, that, uh, something I just thought of, that means your dad potentially was around when the Cubbies won in 1907, 1908. Yeah. Yeah. Did he, he ever was. was he a Cubs fan? Or did he ever talk uh, baseball? He was thing? a Cubs fan, but I don't know about then because he wasn't over here. He was over in Auburn, Indiana. So he could have been a Cubs fan. I know he was a Cubs fan after he got over here, but uh, he didn't come over here until the end of World War One. He was in the National Guard out of Auburn and was the first sergeant of his field artillery unit. And when he found out that I was taking artillery basic, you could, you saw it, he grinned this wide. Because of him being in the artillery, he said I was the only branch of service that required any branch. <clears throat> was the artillery. And in a sense, it was. Because you had to calculate stuff instantly for your range and shot that you were firing and the setup of the gun. Do you want to talk about your military history at all? Well, any cool stories or anything you'd like to, to share? No, I just I was. <clears throat> what was funny was I went in, of course, at Indian, uh, Fort. Uh, well, I went in Indianapolis, and then they moved me to Fort or to Camp, right or Fort Sill, Oklahoma, where I took basic. I came back and was at uh, 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 I can't think of the name of the Fort in Indianapolis. Fort Harrison. Was at Fort Harrison for reassignment. And he got reassigned to Louisiana, Camp Polk, Louisiana. And I went in the finance office because I asked him if I could use my degree, any way in the Army I could use my degree, and they suggested finance, and so I was calculating payroll until I went to Germany, and I got finance in Germany, but he did ask me in Germany, in Germany if I wanted to go somewhere else other than finance. I said, what would I get out of it? And they, they said, we really can't tell you. So I stayed with finance. And that's what I was in when I came home. I calculated payroll. But I still was only a PFC because I got missed out on all my time time and grade promotions. Nobody seemed to give a darn other than me. And when I ask about them, don't worry about it. I wanted the extra money. At least you came home safe. Yeah. We didn't have any problems as far as uh, any little stuff around Germany, that area of Germany where I was. I was at Kaiserslautern, and uh, I can't remember the name of the town that I went into when I was reporting. I was sent down to Kaiserslautern. But uh, I had to fun. I learned a little German language. Enough to say, come with your hair, my friends. But I won't repeat the rest of it. Because you know, and you, you'd probably keep it on the tape. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, Bob, thank you so much for giving me some time to sit you well, down. You're, you're welcome. I hope you can get something out of that that's decent. Yeah, you said some great stuff in there, and I'm sure I'll be able to use a lot of it. Okay. And uh, I can. I assume you guys got a DVD player here. I can bring. Now the next one you got to do is Don Elman. Yeah, got to get Don. Have you been friends with Don, or do you? Uh, yeah, I was friends with him. We were in the same degree in Spanish right. And uh, and then then the Scottish right, I played a couple other parts, but then I played the Pope in one of them. So that was kind of funny. Protestant playing the Catholic Pope, but it was fun. Oh, anything else you want to say about anything at all? 
you know, except I really appreciate you coming over instead of making me go out. Yeah. And secondly, the I, still, you. I still like going to Lodge. I'm not bored or anything. I enjoy it. Which is kind of incredible. For 60 years of doing anything, yeah. I think he's got to get old after a little bit of time. Well, you want to just for kicks, you want to take your camera and uh, look at the Masonic posters I've got in the bedroom? Sure. Let me uh, cut this right now. Okay. And then, uh, yeah, we'll see what you got. It's cool. So what we got here? That's my 50-year certificate. And wait a minute, that's if you remember that's the Scottish right. Excuse me. I think Here's the Scottish right uh oh, council sending grand that. inspectors. Okay. The Superior Council of Sovereign Grand Inspectors General thirty third degree of the Brethren Masonic Jurisdiction, Northern Masonic Jurisdiction, has 50 year membership in the Valley of South Bend. That's just, that's just kind of right, 50 years. You took it already, but that's just kind of right. So that's a 50 year Scottish right? Yes. Or I mean, a uh, certificate. What do you got right there? There is my 50 year Grand Lodge. Blue Lodge. What we got here? That's the Kiwanis. You don't need that. That's just an award for getting the amount of money I got when I was president. I earned it. We brought in. And here's one I just got. Boom. Careful. <laughs> Here, I'll put it on the bed so we can see a little okay. bit. I don't remember. I think it's 60 years. Is it? 60 years of membership. Yeah. Signed by John McNaughton. Mm-hmm. Let's put it back now. Where is it? I'll get it. Okay. And this is what Lake Lodge sent me when my wife died. Does that say 2012? October yeah. 2012? What was your wife's name? What? No, she's in Long Eastern Star. But they, they knew me, they, and she would, oh, she would help out if they needed it in Crown Point. And she didn't do too much of that up here because of the her sorority deal in Highland. She was busy with that. But anyway, this this came from Crown Point. And they surprised the heck out of me. Mary Lou, is that what that said? Yeah. And uh, and that's it. I also have, I forgot to mention, I figured out yesterday, six, 67 years in the Oaks, BPOE. Wow. That was my 21st birthday present for my dad. Because when we do supervision office checks around the North End, he'd check Gary, East Chicago, and Hammond. He'd take his kids with him. We time it so that we ate at the uh, El uh, Elkton in Chicago because he loved that place. Hmm. And he went in it right at the end of World War I when he came over to East Chicago. What do they do though over there at the Elks? I've never been in an Elks Lodge besides uh, the. They are a humanitarian organization. They take uh, it's, it's, uh, it's stuff that Lodge can uh, I wish Masonic Lodge could do. But they can't, because they weren't created for 
uh, or re relief services and stuff like that, you know, food and helping people and finding adoptions and things like this. Whereas the Elks are humanitarian in that sense. They do uh, not necessarily adoptions or anything like that, but they, well, for instance, one of, one of the sponsors, they, they, were, they sponsored a little league before they ever thought of having a little league. And uh, we loved it up there in East Chicago when we grew up. And uh, now it's a parking lot because they, they moved to Highland because they weren't getting any memberships out of East Chicago. And some people weren't very happy with them. But still, they are, they were, they are great. And so that's all I know about them. It's a long time, too. Yeah. Uh, so you used to laugh about it. BPOE, you know what that means? To, to some people, it's the real title of it is Benevolent and Protective Order of the Elks. What does everybody else call it? Biggest pricks on earth. <laughs> <laughs> All right, is there anything else you want to show me? Or no, no, that's it. All right, we'll cut you off. You, you did a great job. Okay, Bobby. thank you.